Hello everyone, this is Laura coming to you today from The Last Days Ministries and today I want to talk to you about a very sensitive, serious subject. Um, up here I've written the sexual and sadistic torture of the Roman Catholic Church throughout the ages. Uh, this video is going to be quite upsetting. Um, I have put a warning on this video but I think it's really super important because of the one world religion that has already started and is growing um, as we speak. There are many quote-unquote evangelical Christians who are following this movement uh, like the Azusa Street the Together 2016, I think there's going to be one in 2018. And many of these people are wolves in sheep's clothing, these teachers. Um, some of them, obviously, you know, Todd White is one of them. He's in, he's at, um, with the Catholic Church. Um, Bill Johnson, Heidi Baker, um, and uh, let me think who else. Uh, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, um, and many, many others um, are involved with this particular movement. Now, in this video, it's going to be discussing, we're going to discuss child abuse, um, homosexuality, um, and what is happening nearby the Vatican. And uh, as you see here, if a person is gay and seeks the Lord and is of goodwill, who am I to judge him? Pope Francis, J July 29, 2013. Uh, and in the last video I gave you, you see him saying that we're not supposed to have a, um, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And of course, that's a lie. Down here, obviously, we see the torture that people went through in the Middle Ages for being a Christian. Um, and the ways they invented torture to torture the Christians. The, Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church did. And here, of course, we see the Pope and a Cardinal, and they're both doing the El Diablo sign, which is of Satan. So I'm going to continue now and let you watch the rest of this video. I pray that it opens people's hearts and eyes to the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's go. La mayor parte de los habitantes del planeta se declaran creyentes. Esto debería provocar un diálogo entre las religiones. No debemos dejar de orar por él y colaborar con quienes piensan distinto. Confío en Buda. Creo en Dios. Creo en Jesucristo. Creo en Dios, Alá. Muchos piensan distinto, sienten distinto, buscan a Dios o encuentran a Dios de diversa manera. En esta multitud, en este abanico de religiones, hay una sola certeza que tenemos para todos. Todos somos hijos de Dios. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Confío en vos para difundir mi petición de este mes. Que el diálogo sincero entre hombres y mujeres de diversas religiones conlleve frutos de paz y justicia. Confío en tu oración. Hello, I'm Lou Engel, and we're hosting Azusa Now at the Memorial Coliseum on April 9th. And we just want to welcome our Catholic brothers and sisters from the Archdiocese of Los Angeles together, together to pray. It was 50 years ago, almost, 1967, the Holy Spirit fell. Duquesne University and the Catholic Charismatic Renewal uh, broke out. We're saying it's time for the outpouring of the Spirit again. Come join your brothers and sisters at the Memorial Coliseum believing for a move of unity and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Every child was beaten, punished, locked in a dark room, made to eat their own vomit. 
and I would say most of us had our mouths rinsed out with carbolic soap. I remember liking it initially. I thought, wow, loads of places to play. And as soon as I walked into the playroom, I threw up and a couple of children came to clean it up. But as soon as the social worker left, that was my first beating. One of the nuns came in and literally pulled me by the ear, which was really painful, and kind of flung me across the room and really tore into me and said, you clean that up, young lady, or I'll make you eat it. So I thought, OK, maybe this place isn't so nice after all. The first um, sexual abuse was with a priest when I was eight, and I had a little part-time job cleaning the pews and so on in the church. And this particular priest would arrive early, and he would ask me to go into a particular room with him, and he would ask me to sit on his lap and fondle him. He tried to fondle me, but I just pulled away. But one particular horrible incident is when he was doing that, and one nun, she walked in on us, and I thought, yes, Finally, someone's realising what's going on here. And instead of being angry at him, she got really angry at me. And she yanked me by the left arm so hard, um, flung me across the room and called me a whore um, and told me to get out of there. And um, I didn't know my arm was broken at the time. It was only the day after that we realised. I think in some ways it was worse than just sexual abuse because I was punished <laughs> with a broken arm for doing something a priest had forced me to do. Sometimes they would have like this rope around their waists with a, a crucifix hanging down on the left hand side and they would literally whack you upside the head with a crucifix. I'm Catholic. That was a horrendous thing to experience, to see a crucifix literally slamming you in the face. When you went to bed, unfortunately you were stripped in the morning, the bed was stripped. You had to take your soiled sheets along a long corridor past the boys' rooms um, to a cold shower and you were chastised and punished. Um, and if they were really nasty sometimes, they would make you sleep in the sheets for several days. And of course, if you soiled every night, it was not a very pleasant thing. I think the nuns realised then that I would be believed if I told someone. So the physical abuse stopped then. Um, that's when the psychological abuse started. The only way I could cope with Smilem was not to let them see that they were breaking me down or that they were trying to break me. And when a nun came along who, uh, who kind of figured that out, that that was my survival strategy. And then when she did everything she could to break me down and make me cry in front of other people and make me feel weak and that I was worth nothing, that is probably the most devastating thing I've ever had to experience in my life. She almost made it such that I didn't get to university. She did everything she could to sabotage. I've never met someone who tried to destroy another person in such a way, a systematic way. Thank God she didn't succeed. That's, that's just heart-wrenching and disgusting and oh my goodness so many I mean we knew there were a few we didn't know there were that many I mean and, and to be in an unmarked grave as well it could have been me you know it could have been me I, I could have been one of them okay so here is another article and uh, that is showing what is happening and you're going to find that this is happening in the Roman Catholic Church all over the world. Okay, so this here is a nun and she was arrested for helping five priests rape deaf children. Oh my gosh. Now this was, this was written on Sunday the 7th of May 2017 at 9.13pm. So here it is, Kosaka Komiko wears a bulletproof vest as she is escorted to a court hearing. So here we go, I'm going to read this. If you're easily upset, you may not want to listen. It, this is upsetting. A Roman Catholic nun stands accused of helping five priests sexually abuse deaf children. 
Kosaka, Kosaka Kumiko, 42, allegedly helped the priest cover up anal and vaginal rapes, fondling and oral sex at the Institute for Deaf Students in Argentina. The abuse allegedly took place in the bathrooms, dorms, garden and a basement at the school in Luang de Xiu, a city about 620 miles north of Buenos Aires. Okay, so, of Buenos Aires, authorities began investigating Comico when a former student claimed she made her wear a nappy oh dear, to cover up bleeding after she was raped. <sighs> At least 24 children have come forward to report abuse at the school. She worked at home, and that's a picture on Facebook. So, Priest Niccolo Coradi pictured handcuffed to a wheelchair, and Reverend Horacio Corbaccio, please excuse me if I'm saying this wrong. Children said Priest Nicola Coradi and Reverend Horacio Corbaccio repeatedly raped them by the image of the Virgin Mary inside the small school chapel. Nobody else would have heard their cries because the other children at the school were deaf. <sighs> okay, abuse by priests is alleged to have taken place where children went to confession as well as elsewhere in the grounds. They always said it was a game. Let's go play. Let's go play. Oh, this is this is just. I'm finding it hard to read this, guys. This is just vile. Anyway, let's just continue. I want this to be exposed so people know what the Roman Catholic Church and what they what the evangelicals are connecting to. So let's let's just look. And they would take us to the girls' be bathroom. And one of the women who claims she was abused at the school in Argentina. Five priests were previously arrested in November by police who raided the school and found porn magazines and about $34,000 in Coradi's room. There is Kamiko allegedly helped the priests. She has been taken away. Horacio Corbaccio was one of the priests accused, so this guy is the one that took advantage of our precious, our precious little children. Just, just disgusting. Okay, this week, Kamu, Kamukio, I'm sorry guys, Kamiko, who is originally from Japan but has Argentine citizenship, was arrested and charged over the allegations she helped them. She also stands accused of physically abusing students in her care. Authorities in Argentina say she has been on the run for about a month before turning herself in. Local media showed the nun in handcuffs and wearing her habit and a bulletproof vest as she was escorted by police to a court hearing. Comico denied any wrongdoing during the eight-hour hearing on Thursday. Authorities, that's Kamiko, escorted by the police. Authorities say that she lived at Provolo Institute for Children with hearing problems from 2004 until 2012. She was first investigated when a former student accused of making her wear a nappy to co cover up a hemorrhage. Oh gosh. After she was allegedly raped by priest Horacio. Corbaccio. Corbaccio fellow priest Nicola Corradi and three other men were arrested last year after they were charged with sexually abusing at least two dozen students at the Bravolo Institute. They are being held at a jail in Mendoza and have not spoken publicly since the arrest. If found guilty, the accused face 10 to 50 years in prison. This is the Antonio Provolo Institute of Ley Yan de Cuyo, Argentine, Argentinian. Carrado had early, 
Parathi had early been accused in Italy of abusing students at the Provolo Institute over in Verona. A notorious school for the deaf where hundreds of children are believed to have been sexually assaulted over the years by two dozen priests and religious brothers. These guys are total pedophiles. Okay. Advocates for clerical sex abuse have expressed anger that Kuradi wasn't sanctioned by the Vatican and, and allegedly went on to abuse children in Pope Francis' native Argentina. A Vatican investigative commission recently visited Mendoza to learn more about the case against the priests. So there you have it, guys. Another disgusting, vile um, case against little children from the Roman Catholic Church. And this is this year. institutional abuse. We haven't told it all. You couldn't possibly tell it all. Because in doing so, I don't think I would ever recover. And that's, there's so much that is just locked in my brain. And I certainly know with hundreds of others. Because the public wouldn't be able to stomach it. Yet we were children and babies, and we had to stomach it. And there is a few aspects in the report. I mean, I only just give it a cursory look. For example, you know, just as Ryan says that the, major the average age going into these hell holes was eight years of age. Totally incorrect. There was babies in Golden Bridge. There was babies turned upside down, beaten to a pulp because they cried. There was babies strapped to potties and we as children were forced to push the rectums up. I went into care at three weeks. I didn't go in at eight. We starved and ate rabbit's feces. We now find today the surplus that these abusers were making. I rest inside the hope of I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't understand, and I'll never understand, how our parents jumped us. I was taken to a room. My clothes were taken from me, and I got a grey dress and big woolly socks. I never saw the coat or the new shoes again. I can always remember she turned and said, Christine, you wouldn't want to be talking like that. People will think you're mad. And he was the only baby smiling in that nursery. And he was fascinated with my fuzzy hair. And I bent down to tickle his belly. And the next thing I remember, being bashed across the head, so much so that the force of my head hit onto his stomach. You, you can see, even in the paper daily, there are more and more victims coming out with it because they now have, they feel they have, they'll be listened to. And not alone will they be listened to, but for the first time they'll be believed. So that's no excuses for children in care today and in the future. And that children, when they say something has happened, the children are believed. And you know, the important thing is to say, it was never, ever my fault. This article that I'm about to read was um, reported in 2013 
and the name of it is Same Rome Block Housing Europe's Biggest Gay Sauna Europa Multi Club. The Vatican's, uh, Vatican owns 20 apartments within the same block that houses Europe's biggest gay sauna it has emerged. The Holy See spent £21 million on the Rome, Rome's real estate in 2008 for the Congregation of the Evangelization of Peoples, a key department responsible for missionary activities, the Independent revealed. It is headed by Cardinal Ivan Diaz, who, was taken, who will take part in Tuesday's papal conclave. Okay, so this was when um, Pope Benedict had been finished and they were bringing in Pope Francis, okay? Um, and who enjoys a 12-room apartment on the first floor of the Palazzo, just yards from the entrance to the steamy, well, you get it, the, the gay bar, okay? Um, excuse that picture, but anyway, um, Europa Multi Club is the continent's biggest gay sauna. Faculties are said, a, um, Europe, Europa Multi Club include Turkish baths, whirlpools, massages, and a Finnish sauna. Okay. The irony of the club's proximity to the holy apartments is openly referenced by. Bear Party host Bruno. I won't go into all that mice. I'm not going to read that. But you get the idea. Like, okay, so according to the BBC, the Vatican has declined to comment on the matter. It points out, however, Cardinal D has, has previously said that gays and lesbians can be pure, cured of their unnatural tendencies through the sacrament of penance. I don't know about that. Anyway, um, Cardinal Ivan Diaz inhabits a 12-room apartment on the first floor of the Palazzo, yards from the entrance to the gay sauna. The revelations come amid reports Pope Benedict XVI's decision to resign was influenced by the discovery of a gay network in the Vatican that led to some clergymen being blackmailed by outsiders. The claims were made last month in Italy's La Repubblica newspaper, which says that the news the network was described in a 300-page report presented to the Pope by three cardinals assigned to invest, investigate the Vati League scandal of 2012. The report allegedly describes divisions in the Roman Catholic Church, including a cross-party network united by sexual orientation okay so guys this is the times and this was written on the 4th of july 2017 at 1201 a.m okay clouds of scandal gather over vatican after police break up gay orgy okay so let's read this vatican broke up a homosexual orgy last month in an apartment belonging to the Congregation for Doctrine of the Faith. The department charged with, among other things, tackling clerical sexual abuse. The occupant of the apartment is allegedly to be the secretary, Cardinal Francesco Coco Palmerio, head of the Pontifical Council for Legislative Texts and a key advisor to the Pope. Cardinal Coco Palmerio is said to have recommended his aid at one stage for promotion to the rank of bishop, but those career plans are likely to be disrupted by news of the orgy and by a period spent recovering from drug overdose in a Rome hospital and another in an Italian monastery. So there you go. Actually, the police broke into that. And this here is the Europa Multi Club website. I'm not going to read it and from it. I just wanted to prove to you that this, and this is in Italy. I'll just show original now. See, that's Tal Italiano. So that's Italian there. That's the club that is in the the apartments. 
and has one of the cardinals that lives very close to them. Medieval tortures. It is a historical fact the Roman Catholic Church supplanted all civil authority of the European governments for exactly 1,260 years. And this began in the year 538 AD and ended in the year 1798 AD when Napoleon sent his general in to capture the Pope of Rome. The most common means of torture included burning, beating, and suffocating. However, the techniques below are some of the more extravagant and depraved methods used and allowed by the Roman Catholic Church. The iron gag or mute's bridle. This device stifles the scream so as not to disturb the conversation of torturers. The iron box on the inside of the ring is forced into the victim's mouth and the collar fastened behind their neck. A small hole allows the passage of air, but this can be stopped up by a touch of the executioner's fingertip, producing suffocation, often constructed with a long spike that pierced the tongue and the floor of the mouth, protruding from underneath the chin, while the other end penetrated up through the bony palate of the mouth into the sinuses. Often those condemned to the stake were thus gagged because their screams would interfere with the sacred pagan music played during the grandiose public festivities in which dozens of heretics were burnt at one time. The pendulum, a fundamental torture, one that is often just a preparation of the victim for more effective infliction of still more tortures. No complex equipment is needed. The victim's wrists are tied behind his back, then a rope is attached to the wrist restraints and the sufferer is slowly hoisted up, ripping the humerus from the sockets and dislocating the scapula and clavicle. The agony can be heightened by means of weights progressively attached to the feet until at last the skeleton is pulled apart as it is by the bench and the ladder racks. The rack. The rack was an instrument of torture often used in the Middle Ages and a popular means of extracting confession. The victim was tied across a board by their ankles and wrists. Rollers at either end of the board were turned by pulling the body in opposite directions until dislocation of every joint occurred. According to Pugablanche, quoted in Mason's History of the Inquisition, in this attitude he experienced eight strong contortions in his limbs, namely two of the fleshy parts of the arms above the elbows and two below, one on each thigh and also on the legs. Bound, the heretic, could then be subjected to other forms of torture. And just to note, the rack was extensively used during the Spanish Inquisition. Other forms included the detainee being fastened in a groove upon a table on his or her back. Suspended above was a gigantic pendulum, the ball of which had a sharp edge on the lower section, and the pendulum lengthened with every stroke. The victim sees this engine of destruction swinging to and fro only a short distance from one's eyes. Momentarily, the keen edge comes nearer and at length cuts the skin and gradually cuts deeper and deeper until their life has fully expired. The ladder rack. Preparation for the ladder rack often started with the crushing of the shins with the screw-activated Spanish boots. With the arms securely affixed behind the victim's back, 
the person was then put onto the inclined slope of the ladder rack. Thus, low, the executioner would push the two heels of the feet forward, causing the victim to plummet downward, so that the shoulders were immediately and violently wrenched out of their sockets. The victim is literally stretched by force of the winch with various old sources testified to increase of 12 inches that comes from the dislocation and extrusion of every joint in the arms and legs, of the dismemberment of the spinal column, and of course the ripping and detachment of the muscles of limbs, thorax and abdomen. But long before the victim is brought to the final undoing, he or she, even in the initial phases of the inquiry, suffers dislocation of the shoulders because his arms are pulled up behind his back, as well as the agony of muscles ripping like any fiber subjected to excessive stress. In the question of the second degree, the knee, hip, and elbow joints begin to be forced out of their sockets with the third degree they separate very audibly. After only the second degree, the sufferer is maimed for life. After the third, he is dismembered and paralyzed, and gradually over hours and days, the life functions cease one by one. The stops. The victim with his or her hands and feet locked into the pertinent holes with bracket irons was then set out in a square where the mob, in the mildest of cases, poked him, slapped him, and besmirched him with feces and urine or substances supplied by the ambiguous chamber pots or open jakes. All of these were smeared into the mouth, ears, nose, and hair. Only the most noxious transgressors could hope to get away with no more than a few black and blue marks and a couple of bumps. Children's books, cinema, and television generally portray the stock in humorous colors centered on a grumpy victim being cajoled and reviled by an always benevolent rough and tumble crowd. Reality was very different. With their feet in the stocks, two pieces of timber clamped together, over and under, both across each leg above the ankles. The soles of their feet, then having been greased with lard, a blazing brazier was applied to them, and they were first blistered and then fried. At intervals, a board was interposed between the fire and their feet and removed once they disobeyed the command to confess themselves of guilt for which they had been charged. Being more painful but less fatal than racking, this was a torture most in vogue when the subject chanced to be of the female sex. It was also favored in cases where children were to be persuaded to testify against their parents. Slider tortures consisted of binding a piece of iron to a limb and putting a twister mark to force it inwards, as was pressing the fingers with rods between them, or removing a nail from fingers or toes, which were all highly practiced until persons of not sufficient strength to survive the pulley, rack, or fire. The barrel pylori, inflicted for the most part on chronic drunkards who were exposed to public ridicule in this fashion. The barrels could be either of two kinds, those closed on the bottom with the victim immersed in feces and urine, or merely putrid water, or open so that the victim could walk and be led about the town with the enormous and very painful weight on their shoulders. Water torture. The victim's nostrils were pinned shut and eight quarts of fluid were poured down the victim's throat through a funnel. Other techniques included forcing a cloth down the throat or pouring water which made a swallowing reflex pushing it further down into the stomach producing all the agonies of suffocation by drowning until the victim lost consciousness. Instead of water, the torture was sometimes conducted with boiling water or vinegar. And it sounds an awful lot, dear ones, like what the CIA uses as waterboarding. So Rome's torture methods have infiltrated this whole world and especially the US police force and government. The Heretic's Fork. This instrument consisted of two little forks, one set against the other, with the four prongs plunged into the flesh, under the chin and above the chest, with hands secured firmly behind their backs. A small collar supported the instrument in such a manner that the victims were usually forced to hold their head erect, thus preventing any movement. The forks did not penetrate any vital points, and thus suffering was prolonged and death was always nearly avoided. The pointed prongs on each end to the crane, the person's head made speech or movement near impossible. The heretic's fork was very common during the height of the Spanish Inquisition. The pair. 
These instruments were used in oral and rectal formats, like the present specimen, and in a larger vaginal one. They are forced into the mouth, rectum, or vagina of the victim, and they are expanded by force of the screw to the maximum aperture of the segments. The inside of the cavity in question is irremediably mutilated, nearly always fatally so. The pointed prongs at the end of the segments serve better to rip into the throat, the intestines, or the cervix. The oral peril was often inflicted on heretical preachers, but also on laypersons guilty of orthodox tendencies. This item became extensively applied throughout the Spanish Inquisition to force confessions from those accused of witchcraft. The Will The Will was one of the most popular and insidious methods of torture and execution practice. The giant spiked wheel was able to break bodies as it rolled forward, causing the most agonizing and drawn out death. Other forms include the braided wheel where the victim would be tied to the execution dock or platform. Their limbs were spread and tied to stakes or iron rings on the grounds. Slices of wood were placed under the main joints, wrists, ankles, knees, hips, and elbows. The executioner would then smash every joint with the iron tired edge of the wheel. However, the executioner would avoid the fatal blows to give the victim a painful death. The Breast Ripper The name of this device speaks for itself. Cold or red hot, the four claws slowly rip to foremost masses the breasts of countless women. This device was highly put in the service during the massacre of the Danes. Hanging Cages these cages were usually hung around the outsides of town halls and ducal places. They were also near the town hall of justice and surprisingly cathedrals. The victim, naked and exposed, would slowly wither from hunger and thirst. The weather would second the victim's death by heat stroke and sunburn in the summer and cold in the winter. The victims and corpses were usually previously mutilated before being put into the cages to make a more edifying example of the punishment. The cadavers were left in the cages until the bones literally fell apart. The Garot Originally the Garot was simply hanging by another name. However, during medieval times, executioners began to refine the use of rope until it became as feared and as vile as any serious punishments. Executioners first used the Garot to end the suffering of heretics broken on the will. But by the turn of the 18th century, the seed of an idea involving slow strangulation was planted in the minds of lawmakers, Satan. At first, garrots were nothing more than an upright post with a hole bored through. The victim would stand or sit on a seat in front of the post and chanting crowd, and a rope was looped around his or her neck. The ends of the cords were fed through the hole in the post. The executioner would then pull on both ends of the cord, twist them tourniquet style, slowly strangling the victim. Later modifications include a spike fixed into the wood frame at the back of the victim's neck, parting the vertebrae as the rope tightened. The Head Crusher With the victim's chin placed on the lower bar, a screw then forces the cap down on the victim's cranium. The recipient's teeth are crushed and forced into the sockets to smash the surrounding bone. The eyes are compressed from their sockets and brain from the fractured skull. This device, although not a form of capital punishment, is still used for interrogational purposes. It was to inflict extreme agony and shock and leave the victim in his grasp for hours. Other methods include the head screw below, which was placed around the forehead and tightened. The accused became so frantic by the extreme panic of having their head crushed that they confessed to anything burnt at the stake. If the Inquisitor wanted to be sure no relics were left behind by an accused and convicted heretic, he would select death by burning at the stake as the preferred method of execution. With few exceptions, death came from being burned alive. Frequently, burning a victim at the stake was cause for a crowd. Not content to merely learn about the spectacle after it was over, the masses wanted to be entertained. The Iron Maiden or Virgin of Nuremberg was a tomb-sized container with folding doors. The object was to inflict punishment, then death. Upon the inside of the door were vicious spikes. As the prisoner was shut inside, he or she would be pierced along the length of their body. The tailings were not designed to kill outright. 
The pinioned prisoner was left to slowly perish in the utmost pain. Some models included two spikes that were driven into the eyes causing blindness. One of these diabolical machines was exhibited in 1892. The strapido, one of the most common torture techniques. All one needed to set up a strapido was a sturdy rafter and a rope. The victim's wrists were bound behind their back and the rope would be tossed over the beam. The victim was repeatedly dropped from a height so that their arms and shoulders would dislocate. This was a punishment of the secret tribunal until 1820. Judas Cradle The victim was stripped, hoisted, and hung over this pointed pyramid with iron belts. Their legs were stretched out frontwards or their ankles pulled down by weights. The tormentor would then drop the accused onto the pyramid, penetrating both orifices. With their muscles contracted, they were usually unable to relax and fall asleep. Revelation 20 verse 4 And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Hi guys, so that's the end of the video. I just wanted to say, please try and share this with other people so that they can see the truth. And if they're following people like Todd White, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, um, Mike Bickle, anybody like Bill Johnson, Heidi Baker, any of these people are Roman Catholic sellouts. Um, so I just wanted to say that and, you know, guys, please be careful. The Bible says this. In the last days, many false prophets shall arise, and many false teachers shall arrive, arise and deceive the elect, if it were so possible. So guys, this is all I have for you for today. May the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, and may the Lord let his light to shine upon you. And I'll talk to you super soon. Bye for now. Bye-bye.